If you'll turn your Bibles with me to John, the 10th chapter. John, the 10th chapter. Familiar passage, familiar verses. John, the 10th chapter, verse 27 through 29. How to be sure you are eternally secure. I have to apologize to you this morning because I should have already preached this. Because I come to the realization that there are people in our world and Christians that do not know if they are eternally secure. You can say, well, I, I know for sure that I know Jesus Christ. Well, that's great. I didn't ask you if you knew Jesus Christ. I ask you to be sure that you're eternally secure. You see, the question is, is there something more wonderful than knowing that you can be saved? Is there something more wonderful than just knowing that you can be saved. Yes, there is. What is it? It's knowing you can be saved and being certain you're saved. And you can also know that you can never lose your salvation. You see, John, the 10th chapter, starting with verse 27, says this. Verse 27 of the 10th chapter of John, page 1333. Maybe you're not ahead of me tonight, Rodney. Okay. But verse 27 says, My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them to me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we take a moment to talk this morning and tonight about how to be sure that we are eternally secure, are we certain without a shadow of a doubt? Are we sure, are we sure, are we sure, do we know, do we know, do we know that we're saved? And that once we are truly saved, we can never lose that salvation. And so, Lord, as we look at and talk about the eternal security of the believer, May we take it to heart, each of us, to me, to everyone that's here under the sound of your voice. And Lord, I pray that you'll just continue to speak to us and strengthen us. And Lord, if there's one that's lost, may these be the moments of salvation. If there's one today that's distraught and they don't know for sure that they're saved, may this be the day they commit to you. That they'll turn their life. And it says their old life will pass away and they'll become a new creature. And all things will become new. And Lord, we need new appetites. We need new excitement. We need new enthusiasm. But Lord, let us realize that we are eternal, eternally secure. So bless you and direct us as we take a moment to look, hear, and to appreciate that we'll never lose our salvation. And so Lord, I thank you for these opportunities. And Lord, I pray that your word will be prevalent in our approach. And we pray this now in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today I'm talking, this is part one of the part two. There's two parts to this. The sermon will be finished tonight. I want to encourage you to come be back with us tonight at 6 o'clock. But we're talking about the eternal security of the believer. I want to give you some reasons and how you are eternally secure. That's what I want to give you. And that's what God laid on my heart several days ago as we are approaching Easter. We are pre approaching a time where we celebrate the birth, the resurrection, and the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Where he died on the cross and shed his blood for you and I. Where he arose on the third day as he promised, and he lives. And so today I encourage you as we look at the word of God, may the word speak to our hearts and strengthen us like we've never been strengthened before. But today, are you eternally secure? Only you can answer that question. So I want to give you some reasons and why. But first, I want to give you a couple of general uh, spiritual comments before we get started. First, is that the eternal security is necessary for spiritual health. 
You see, the reason that some churches are dying today is because they do not know if they are secure. And today, I beg you as a believer, I beg you as a Christian, do you know that you are saved without a shadow of a doubt and that Christ is real inside of you? And I'm not talking about just something that you come and you attend and you do, but you feel the presence of Jesus in your life. You see, eternal security is necessary for spiritual health. It's a must can you imagine that what the emotional state of any child would be if they don't know from day to day whether or not they belong to the family or if they're a member of the family? Can you hear them saying in their selves, am, am I today in the family or am I not today? Am I received into the family or have I not been received to the family? Can you hear the emotional stress that the family and a child would feel? Not knowing it's necessary for emotional strength in this world to get through this world and, and, and to know that you're eternally secure. The reason that I'm so excited about Jesus is because I know I'm eternally secure. That I will never lose my salvation. That no problem, no frustration, no hardship or crisis will take Jesus from me. And that he is prepared to play place for you and I. Folks, it is necessary. It is a must to have spiritual health. You don't want to be emo that emotional child that doesn't know if you belong or don't belong. We belong to the kingdom of Jesus. And now my friends, people don't know that they're saved and secure don't have emotional stability. You say, what in the world? You see, there's Christians that go running off instead of being emotionally st uh, stable. Why can we be stable? Is because we know that no matter what takes place, Christ is the king and that we're going to see him one day. My friends, that's a, a child of God ought to have is eternal security. Now, the second thing that I wanted to tell you in general is eternal security is necessary for spiritual protection. Pro, you know, I messed up this word last week too, didn't I? And I'm real good about messing up where my words is productivity. Spiritual productivity. It's necessary if we're going to be productive. And today I want to encourage you, we are to be Christians that are productive, that are seeking the King of kings and Lord of lords. If we're going to be fruit-bearing Christians, listen, we need to know the future is secure and that you can concentrate on the, on the present. On the present of the moment. Matter of fact, I thought of a story when I thought about, am I secure in this present moment in my life? And I thought, of, I thought about this story that, that uh, I certainly wrote down because I forget stories just like uh, everything else. But am I spiritually productive? Am I producing and am I being productive that God desires for me to produ be productive? There's a story, it was dated in 1937. They built this marvelous bridge. Many of, us, of you have probably seen it. What's it called? The Golden Gate Bridge. But the workers were afraid that they might fall. Did you know that? That it seemed like that every fear of falling would uh, cause them to fall. Though they spent $75 million on the Golden Gate uh, Bridge. Now you've got to remember, that's a lot of money in 1937, $75 million dollars. And they failed to put up a safety net. And so when they were building the bridge, 23 people on the first section of that bridge fell to their death and died. So they decided that they would build a safety net under that bridge that cost them $100,000. That's a lot of money at that time. And now $100,000, like I said, is a lot of money to me today. But they felt it was worth it, so they built this safety net and the workers of the next section of the bridge. So after they built the next section of the bridge, only 10 men fell. The only difference was 23 died on the first section, but nobody died on the second. All 10 fell into the net and were brought into safety. Folks, that's what eternal security is, that we have security in Jesus, that even when we fall, even when circumstances come, even when hardships come our way, we've got a heaven, a place prepared for each and every one of us. And my friends, you've got to realize, so we are as a child of God. We know that his future is secure and we can concentrate on the present so many of you are worried about the past and worried about the future worry about the present because Christ has secured you with eternal security but the second thing uh, the last thing I would tell you about this is that eternal security is necessary for soul winning 
today it's very important not only to have spiritual health, not only to have spiritual productivity, but my friends, but it, it will help you in so winning. Do you know why a good number of people never get saved? Do you know why people don't join churches and accept Jesus? Because they are afraid that they may, uh, may not be able to hold out. They may not be able to hold out. They say, I just, I'm not able. I don't have the strength. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the willpower. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have what I need. So I don't have what it takes. They are fearful that they're going to have a false start and fall away. That's why people don't receive Jesus Christ today. They may be somebody sitting right here and in their hearts of hearts, you want to be saved, but you're fearful. You've allowed fear to overcome you. That our world has done, turned dark, but my friends, Jesus is still the light and will be the light and will give you eternal security. But we're fearful we'll get a, start with a false start and fall away. If we could only teach people the Bible, if we could only say to them the fact that, that God who saves you is the God who secures you. My friends, I am so excited that the God that saved me will secure me no matter what goes on in my life. He is the God that keeps you and he will save you. He saved me and he's kept me. And praise God he has. So what do we mean when we're talking about eternal security of the believer? Now listen, if you're not saved today and you want this, we want to give you an invitation and invite you to come and receive it. But listen to me, I am speaking to believers. Only believers have eternal security of the believer. What do you mean by you say the believer? We're not talking about someone who just has head knowledge. We're not talking about somebody that just joined a church and has been baptized and give their money to religious things. That's well and good. But none of those things, none of those things will save you. None of them. And so very often, well, I joined the church and I was baptized when I was a kid and I'm saved. Are you sure without a shadow of a doubt that you are saved? Those things will not save you. The only thing that will save you is Jesus Christ that died on the cross and resurrected and is alive today. You see, we're not talking, my friends, we're not just talking about anything. We're talking about a person who received Christ in his or her life and in their heart by faith, who have become partakers of the divine nature, who have been uh, twice born and who have received a new birth. That person can never, ever again be lost. And I don't know about you, but that makes me as a Baptist want to do a dance and jig. That makes me want to shout from the mountaintop that there is nothing that you can do or say or this world can do or my enemies can do that will take my salvation through Jesus Christ. My friends, you say, Pastor, well, that causes a problem. What, what problem does it cause in you? I know people who have been saved and now they're no longer saved. Well, if you know them, I'm glad you know them. But my friends... Uh, you may have thought that, they, that you knew that they were saved, but folks, they were never saved if they're not saved today. See, don't forget what it says in Matthew, the 7th chapter, verse 22 and 23. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have you prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name I've done many wonderful works. Folks, you can work yourself to the bone. But listen, verse 23 and then when I profess unto them, I knew you not, depart from me for that, that work of iniquity. You know what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying, you can do all those things, you can do all those wonderful works, but I don't know you. You see, Jesus desires to know us personally, individually, who we are, what we are, and wants to commune with us every single day of our lives. And he wants to give you this eternal life. He wants to give you this thing. Matter of fact, the verses I just read to you says no one will be able to pluck you out of the hand of God. So it says here in 1 John, the second chapter, verse uh, 19, says they went from us, but they were not of us. For they had been of us, they would have no doubt have continued with us, but they went out and they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, my friends, what he's trying to tell us in that verse is there are people. Listen, the faith that fizzles before the finish had a flaw from the first. 
You know, I, you know, we got so many Alka Seltzer Christians today, they fizzle for a little while and then sooner or later the bubbles go. You see, we've got to realize today that the reasons why and how we have eternal security of the believer. They all start with a P with me this morning. P. So if you will, uh, let me tell you the first one. What's the first P? How do I know I'm eternally secure? How do I know that I am sure that I'm sure that I'm sure without a shadow of a doubt that I have salvation is number one, I have a promise. Promise. God has made you a promise. If you're a believer and you've accepted him and he's the king of kings and lord of lords of your life, then he's made you a promise. He's made you a promise. When we're talking about the eternal security of people who have a personal, vital relationship with Jesus Christ, God has promised you eternal security. He's promised it. Paul says in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse uh, 39 and 38, he says, for I am persuaded. Now, when he says there in the 8th chapter of Romans, verse 38, that I am persuaded, that means he is absolutely convinced. There's not a shadow of a doubt. The Apostle Paul is certain about it. He says, For I am persuaded, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor things, uh, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Now, my friends, if you can go through that verse. Now, that's Romans 8, chapter, verse 38 through 39. If you think of something that Paul left out in that verse that might separate you from God, anything, please come and let me know after service because I will give you a two-week paid vacation to Hawaii. Paul left nothing out. Paul left nothing out that will separate you from the love of God. Please come and tell me. <clears throat> My friends, he is saying, I promise uh, you there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God. So if you're a child of God, listen, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Amen? God loves us. I love that. But there's a big if. You know, you know what that big if is? The Kansas City Chiefs just scored a touchdown. Did you know they're playing this morning? Y'all think it's at 630, don't you? It doesn't. It's right now. Touchdown. Here's the big if. What's the big if? If you are truly a child of the King. If you're truly a child of the King, He's made a promise to you. And folks, I revel in that promise. Why do I know I'm eternally secure? How do I know for sure that no matter what goes on in this world, what goes on in my life, that is the promise of God. He has promised me that height nor death nor any angels nor principalities nor anything shall be able to separate me from the love of God. Doesn't that make you excited? Are we, are we awake this morning? Hello? Church, I, that excites me that I have the promise of God that he's promised to give me eternal security of the believer. He's promised me the love of God. And if Paul left anything out, please let me know, but Paul left nothing out. Maybe you didn't read the verse with me, but the, it says this, For I am persuaded, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate you from the love of God. My friends, that's it. Folks, that's the promise. And today I encourage you to have that promise. To know that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, God loves you. He sent his only son to die for you. And my friends, I want you to realize something about that love of God. He'll love you the way you are, and he'll accept you just the way you are now. But listen, but he loves you so much, he won't leave you that way. He won't leave you that way. He loves you so much that he wants to say, hey, let me help change you to what you're supposed to be in my life. Do you have that relationship on a promise? Well, the second thing that I thought about this morning when I thought about all the P's, the first one was promise. The second was perseverance. Here, how and why do I have the eternal security of the believer? I, we're all saved if we accepted Jesus Christ. We are genuine. If we're genuine, we got the promise. But the second thing is this. And my friends, you're, you don't have a genuine relationship if you doubt if you're sure. Folks, we have, you don't have to doubt about the love of God whatsoever. There's no doubt there to have. The second thing is perseverance. Now, my friends, the Holy Spirit will finish what he's begun in you. The Holy Spirit will finish what he's begun in you. Listen, God will complete what he began. Uh, the last verse, Paul said, I'm persuaded. But he uses 
being confident in Philippians 1, verse 6. Listen to what he says. Philippians 1, 6. Being confident of this very thing, that which he hath begun, a good work in you, will perform it into the day of Jesus Christ. Listen, when you got saved, he began a good work in you. Now, I'm not going to tell you that work is done. It says he's done, begun a good work in you. That means he's still working on you. And I'm thankful that I serve a God that's still working on me. Aren't you thankful that you serve a God that's still working on you? I mean, my friends, if you're complete and you're perfect, you're in the wrong place. You don't belong in church. You belong in heaven. Because I want to tell you, redemption's only when you get to heaven. But my friends, it's perseverance. He says, being confident of this very thing, he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When you got saved, he began a good work in you. Was it you or God that began that work? God began it. Now, my friends, it was God. 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 19 says, We love him. Why? Because he first loved us. He first loved us. Do you know if you're saved today and you've accepted Jesus Christ and you have this eternal security that I'm talking about and you are sure, you're sure, you're sure and you stand on the promise and you got perseverance, my friends, listen, the only reason that you're saved is because he caught you and he can run faster than you. Because so very often we're trying to outrun God and today we need to stop and say, God, I'm going to have perseverance. Why am I going to have perseverance? Because my friends, he's begun a good work in me and because he loved me first. He began the good work in us. He was the one who called us. The Holy Spirit is the agent of new birth. And let me tell you what the Holy Spirit is. You want to know what the Holy Spirit does to you when you're saved? The Holy Spirit is the convictor. It's the convictor. First of all, he is the convictor. He is the one who convicted you of your sin. Isn't that right? The Holy Spirit. That's, that, that, that's, the, that's Jesus alive in this world today. That Holy Spirit convicted us. And, and he's the convictor of our sin. He was the one who showed you that you're a sinner and you needed to be saved. And I'm thankful that he showed me that I needed to be saved. I'm thankful that when I was in vacation Bible school at age 9, I walked down that aisle and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was not ashamed of my Jesus and I was baptized in, by the water and the water washed me clean white as snow and that sin all dissipated. And today we can be forgiven and I'm thankful we serve a God of many chances. But folks, we can have perseverance. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, Spirit has, is, is the convictor. But secondly, the Holy Spirit is the converter. Not only has he convicted you, he has converted you. He was the one that opened your eyes. He was the one who helped you understand the gospel. He is the one who put faith in your heart and helped you to receive the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's the convictor, he's the converter. But thirdly, he is the completer. The Holy Spirit is the completer. He is the convictor and converter, but my friend, he's the completer. It says, he which hath begun a good work in you. That's the convictor and converter. But listen to this. Listen to this. Woo, this, this, this Baptist is fixing to do some dancing in God's house. We'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Wait a second. That Holy Spirit lives in me because I've invited Jesus. I'm in Jesus Christ. Jesus is inside of me. And because he's inside of me, he says, I'm going to do what? He says, he will perform it to the day of the Jesus Christ. Have you, under, uh, ha have you ever started anything you couldn't finish? Starting anything that you couldn't finish. Listen, Jesus has never started anything he ain't able to finish. My friends, God the Father has never started anything that he can't finish. My friends, the Holy Spirit of God has never started anything that he's not able to finish. You see, the reason that I'm, I'm eternally secure is because of the promise of God. He's promised it, but I've got perseverance. That means he's still working in me and he's going to work unto me until the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus hadn't come again, but when he comes, he's going to stop working on us and he's going to take us home. My dear friends, when I thought about perseverance, I thought about and about uh, that he will never, that he's going to finish what he started. I thought about a story about Billy. I heard that Billy said to, uh, uh, about a little boy that said to Jimmy, his friend, he says, my daddy has a list of men he can whip. And Jimmy, 
you need to know your dad's uh, on the list, and he's not just on the list, he's number one. So Jimmy went home and he told his dad, he said, Dad, I want to tell you something. Billy's daddy has a list of men that he can whip, and your name is on the list number one. Jimmy's daddy went to see Billy's daddy. He rolled up his sleeves and he says to that daddy, he says, I understand that you have a list of people you can whip, and my name is number one on the list. Is that right? And the, the other daddy said, yep, that's right. He said, well... Can you do it? What are you going to do about it? Here I am. He said, well, I'll just take your name off the list. I'll just take your name off the list. I'm so glad that God has, to, has never taken anybody's name off the list. I'm so glad that God never starts anything that he's not able to finish. That's the job. Whether it's big or too small, our God can do it all. I'm thankful that I can have perseverance and know without a shadow of a doubt what he's began in me, he's going to finish. That's perseverance. That's what we need today in our church and in our lives. You see, if you're a child of God, any child of God, listen, we will never be defeated as long as Christ lives inside of us. God will make his purposes take place. Have you figured that out yet? There's things that's happened in your life that God has not ordained for it to happen, but it's going to happen because uh, when it, things do happen, uh, that God's going to make sure that it's done, and he's going to do it, and he's going to do it for you and I. So that means that Jesus, listen, if Jesus doesn't finish the work that he's begun in you, that means Jesus' blood and dying on Calvary was for vain. Folks, I don't know about you, but I know without a shadow of a doubt he's going to finish what he's begun in me, right? And he didn't take your name off the list. He's still working on you. He's saying, hey, I love you. He's saying, hey, you may not have been everything you wanted, I wanted you to be, but hey, I'm still working on you, and I love you. I want to give you a chance. And maybe today God's knocking on your door, and he's saying, folks, he has began something, and it's all for the glory of God. He will complete what he has started inside of you. So, well, I got those two words. I understand them. But I want to give you one that people do not understand. And, and I don't understand it all, and I'm not supposed to understand it all. I can go to every school and eat every theological conversation that's ever had, and there's going to be always somebody who can split that theological hair 16 ways. But let me give you the third P. How do I know and the reason why? Predestination predestination you're going wait a second brother Jeff now that's a word I don't understand I am predestined and you are predestined to be like Jesus Christ if you're saved and you're eternally secure is you are predestined if you're truly saved now predestination only applies to saved people that's all and people love to take this scripture and turn it wrong side out God has to ter determined uh, to fulfill his purpose for the believer. People often abuse and misuse this passage. And, and I'm about to read. It's in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 29 through 30, that says, For whom he did foreknow, he also predestinate to be conformed to the image of the Son, that he might be the firstborn among my brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, listen, we've got to understand something. Pre predestination in the basic Greek is porizo. In the basic Greek is porizo. That's what predestination is. That means to mark off or to set off. That's what it means in the Greek. So, God has determined your destiny as a believer. He's only talking about believers, not non-believers. And so he's already determined. God knows the past, the present, and the future of all at one time. And I'm thankful that he knows the beginning and the end because I don't know the ending, and you don't want to know the ending because if you knew the ending, then you wouldn't need God. We need God, and so we don't need the, uh, to know the future. But God sees you now already in heaven. Did you know that? You're not sitting in this church. You're sitting in heaven. Did you know that? 
He already sees you as in, in heaven. So let me tell you something about this predestination. Predestination is settled. It's settled. We are conformed in the image of his son. Now, some of us need to learn to act like we're in the son of Jesus. <laughs> but people think that God predestined people to be saved and predestined people to be lost. God did not. God does not predestine anybody to go to hell. Nobody. He desires for everybody to get saved, no matter who you are and what you've done. Don't ever get the ideology that that's the case. This predestination is talking about people who have already trusted Jesus. When you trust Jesus, that settles it. You're going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's settled. So, do you understand predestination, Pastor? The answer is no. No, I don't. But that doesn't bother me. You know why it doesn't bother me? And it shouldn't bother you. Why? Because there's some things God understands that I don't understand, and I don't have to understand. As long as he understands, that's all that matters. God said it, and I believe it. Amen? My friends, I don't understand electricity, but I'm not going to sit around in the dark until I do. Right? I'm not going to sit around and wait till I do. Uh, there are some things that we don't understand, but we can appropriate and live it. Why? Because God said it. Now, let me give you an example, if you don't mind, before we go from predestination. This illustration is the simplest way I can tell you about predestination. So I get on a plane in New York, and it goes to London. The other side of the pond. It's a 747. A big plane. Mega gem plane. Don't get on a 737. Those ones that are failing right now. Don't get on one of those. Get on a 747. So you get on the airplane. You sit down. And you sit there in your seat. There are magazines you can flip through. There are headphones where you can listen to music. and I, uh, That you can listen to. And some lady comes by and says, Would you like a soft drink? What do you do? You choose whether you want fruit juice or water or Diet Coke. We fly a little bit further. She comes around and says, I have a meal. Do you want beef or chicken? And I decide what I want. And after a while, I get up, I go to the restroom, I go back and I snooze a little bit. And, and I make all these decisions. Then the plane lands in London. Folks, that's the way it is in life. You make all these decisions. But God controls where the airplane goes. That's predestination. God controls all that. God has a plan that you're going to be like Jesus. And nobody can take that from you. If you're saved today, then you're going to be like Jesus Christ. And if you don't want to be like Jesus Christ, then you're in the wrong religion. You see, the landing of the airplane is already predestined. You can walk around in it all you want. You can eat in it all you want. You can make the decisions all you want. But God one day is going to make you like his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Indeed, if you're saved, you're going to be like him whether you like it or not. Life is filled with mystery, misery, and magnificence. And folks, I want to tell you, I'm so glad I'm going to be like Jesus one day. Because I'm tired of being fat. I'm tired of looking like I, you know, every day I get up and look in the mirror and I see and I go, God, it's, this is good as it gets. Listen, they don't make uh, plastic surgery for fat folk. I've been trying to get them to suck my fat out for years. They said I had too much, I'd break the machine. But listen, one day you're going to be like Jesus Christ. And my friends, we are made in the image of him. And that's predestination. He's predestined for his believers to be like the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the strive and that's the go. Every Sunday, that's where we're heading. We're heading towards Christ. We're heading to what he wants us to be. Not what I want you to be or what the world wants you to be or what your friend wants you to be or what your wife wants you to be. You know, you are what you are. And you are what you are in Christ. But now I thought about, folks, what is settled in eternity cannot be undone by time and cannot be decreed. If it's been decreed in heaven, can't annul what's already been done in heaven, whether it's hell or not. 
that tries to undecree what you've already done. God never changes his mind. Did you know that? Romans 11 verse 29 says, The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. That's Romans 11th chapter verse 29. The gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. He does not change his mind. So we're all going to be like Jesus. We're going to learn. Listen, there's only been one Christian that's been perfect that walked the face of this earth and his name is Jesus Christ. And folks, we are not looking at Christians when we sit in our churches. The only perfect Christian is Jesus. He is our goal and aim. You are predestined if you believe in Jesus Christ today. That's why and how I know I'm eternally secure. But also there's another P that comes to my mind. And, and this one I know that we all are, would be excited about this when this time comes. Is perfection. Perfection. I've been made perfect by the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10 verse 14 says, By one offering he, which is Jesus, hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now what is this one offering? Jesus' precious blood pouring out on Calvary's cross. That's that perfect one. That one offering makes you perfect forever. When you get saved, you, you don't just get a fresh start. You get a new nature. You get a new nature. That means the old appetite's gone and there's a new appetite in. And that's where I, I'm, I'm wondering, where are the Christians today? Why are we not excited if we got a new appetite? My friends, my new appetite is for the pepperoni of Jesus. Listen, you are perfected forever. Listen, Jesus is never going back to the cross. You say, wait a minute, Pastor, I, I'm not perfect. That's true. But in our flesh, we are not perfect. Then you say, well, if I'm saved and then I sin again, what happens? <laughs> what do you mean what happens? God carries you to the woodshed. And he whips you. Because what does it say in Hebrews 12, 6? It says, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Romans 4, 7 says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Because we are uncovered and God covered them. God is covered because when you confess it, he forgives it. We're going to be perfect. Why? Because we accepted Jesus. He forgave us of our sins. When he forgave us of our sins, my friends, then we were made perfect in the blood of Jesus Christ. Not because of our blood, not because of anything we did, because he did, because he loves you. What happens when you mess up is he spanks you. And I don't know about you, then we need to learn not to get spankings. Listen, I was the worst of all the children in my family. I was the one that got all the spankings. Listen, if you didn't know, I'm part of a family. They're all blonde hair, blue-eyed, and left-handed. My mama and my daddy. Now, my brothers and sisters used to tell me that the stork brought me to the wrong house. So I went crying one day to daddy, and daddy says, No, son, that's not what happened. We picked up the wrong baby out of the nursery. You see, I'm not a blonde hair, blue-eyed, and left-handed. My mom always told me the postman came. I don't know. But I know this. I'm perfect in the eyes of Jesus. And you're perfect in the eyes of Jesus if you've received him. You're going to be like him. And he says, those that are sanctified are perfect. He said, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. And because we are uncovered, God covered them. Because we confessed it, God forgave it. So my friends, I don't know about you, but I'm excited about Christ covering them and forgiving. Well, there's another P that I want to give you this morning, and that P is position. Position. I'm part of the body of Christ. You are, you are already positioned in the Lord Savior Jesus Christ. What does it say in 2 Corinthians 5.17? It says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. 
Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That means the old creation, creation that's Adam and his children. Listen, listen, when we're born, we're born into Adam. And we're born, and listen, uh, Adam lost the, the, the kingdom of God. And God sent Jesus to come back and, and win it back again. A legal heir to the kingdom of God. Now, my friends, that means that we need to realize that Adam and the children are children of disobedience. But we're going to have a new creation. That means we're in Jesus and his children children it, and it says if any man be in Christ he's a new creature if you're in the Lord Jesus Christ today my friends we are a new creature aren't you excited about being a new creature old things are passed away and you become new in Jesus Christ folks are we living in that newness today are we allowing this world to rob us of that newness that God has given us this called position Christ when he died and you accepted Christ he positioned you as a new creature I love that. You see, what is true of Christ is true of you. Because you're in Christ. You're not in yourself. You're a part of his body. You are, you're in his hands. Isn't that what it says? Now, I thought it, there was an interesting passage here in Genesis, the 7th chapter, verse 16. This is what God said in Genesis, the 7th. Seventh, seventh chapter, verse 16. It says, and the Lord shut him out. Now, who's he talking about? He shut out. Now, my friends, he's talking about Noah and the ark. Why did God shut the door? God shut the door uh, to keep the water out and to keep Noah in. Now, my friends, there was no doorknob on the outside. Did you realize that? There was no door, doorknob on the inside of the ark. See, Ephesians says, uh, after we have believed, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Not only the, uh, not the, the only way that Noah could have went down was what? For the ark to go down. For the ark to go down. And the only way for you to lose your salvation is for Jesus to go down. That's the only way that you can lose your salvation is that Jesus goes down. You see, you see the security is not in a place. Your security is in a person and his name is Jesus. Folks, we are in position when we're in Christ and we say, Christ, come into my life, receive me. I'm a sinner. I fall short. Become new inside of me and give me a new creation and a new appetite and a newness in my life. He positions us. And my friends, we are in the position of security. Your position is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, there's nobody else I'd want to be in. But some of us are in so much other things. Some of us are in this world. Some of us are in the, uh, of our mom and daddies. We're in this world of a church. Folks, I'm not in this for Fairview Baptist Church. I'm not in it for what somebody else thinks. I'm in it for Jesus Christ. I'm in Christ Jesus. And some of us walk around like we are some foreigners from some Asian country. Folks, we're not from some Asian country. We're in Christ Jesus. He died and he resurrected. You accepted that. And when you accept that, you accept his position, not your position. And so I'm excited by that. I hope you're excited by that. How else am I eternally secure is another word that starts with P. It's called possession. Possession. I, 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 have our, I, I already have eternal life. I already have eternal life. What did it say in John 10, verse 27 through 29? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Listen to this. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hands. Possession. John, the fifth chapter, verse 24 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath ever lasting life you want to get it you can't get it if you already got it you see everlasting life is something uh, you get when you repent and believe not when you die possession is knowing Christ now you have it right now you have eternal security and I don't know about you, but, but I'm excited about that eternal security, and I have it now. Listen, eternal life doesn't start the day you die. Eternal life starts the moment you receive Jesus. 
And we need to start living in that eternal life, do we not? There's so many Christians that are eating out of the garbage can. You need to stop eating out of the garbage can. It doesn't matter what this world does, no matter what hurt you're dealing with, no matter what financial... Well, Brother Jeff, you don't know my situation. I do know your situation. I live in this world too. And yes, we've all got hurts, but you've got to let it go because you're in Christ Jesus. You're a possession of Him. And folks, we are in possession of eternal life, and it will never go anywhere. So let's walk in eternal life. Why do we have to act like when we we come to church we're going to a funeral Jesus is alive Woo, he's alive and I'm glad he lives in me I, I listen I, we've got to realize we are already in possession of eternal life if you're not living in heaven now there's something wrong with you I'm living in, in heaven now now my friends there's another word that I wanted to give you besides possession and it's called prayer Jesus is praying for you the reason I'm eternally secure is because I'm in possession. Because I'm perfect. Because I'm in prayer. Jesus Christ is interceding for you. John 17, 9 says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but I pray for them which thou hast given me, and for they are thine. Now, why does God, why does Christ pray for us? You may ask. John, the 17th chapter, verse 15 says, I pray not that they should... Uh, uh, that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shalt keep them from evil. God's praying for us that he keeps us from evil. Hebrews 7 verse 25 says, He ever liveth to make intercession for them. We're the them. He is praying for your every day, your every night, your every day, your every night, your year after year after year. He's praying for you on the basis of his perfect sacrifice. That's the reason you're secure, is prayer. God is praying. He put a hedge of protection around you. The only reason that the, Satan could get to Job was what? God let the hedge down and let him attack Job. Folks, there's nobody can attack you. Uh, no one so ever in this world can attack you unless Christ allows them. He's praying for you. But there's one last thing I wanted to give you. If we're going to be eternally secure... It's 1 Peter 3 through 5 that says this. It says, Blessed be the God of the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The last P that I would give you today, this morning, and I better be quiet because there's a whole lot more still to come tonight, is power. It is the, God's power that keeps you. It says, who kept you by the power of God? John 10, 28 says what? Neither shall any man pluck you out of the hand of God. That's power, my friends. That's power. Nobody can take you out of God's hand. God's saying, I'm toting you around. Folks, you know that, that little saying that you see in people's houses they have on a plaque of the footprints in the sand and it says it's not your footprints? No, those are God's footprints because he's toting you in his hands. He's toting you in his hands and it is by his power. Listen, we stay in the hand of God by God keeping us. How does he keep us in his hands? That's the reason you're eternally secure. Thank God you're saved and you are sure. But folks, if you are not sure, folks, you've got a promise from God. Not only do you have a promise, you have a perseverance. That means the Holy Spirit will finish what he starts in you. You have predestination to be like Jesus. That, uh, and we've got to realize that perfection is by the blood of Jesus, not by our blood, not by anything we did, but by the blood of Jesus. But the position is the body of Christ. We are positioned in his body as a child of God if you're saved today. But my friends, possession, we already have eternal life. And some of you are not living in eternal life right now, and I don't understand why. And then we've got to realize Jesus is praying for you. He's interceding for you. But lastly, God keeps us in his power. You want to hear the rest of this sermon, you come back tonight at, at 6 o'clock. Well, Brother Jeff, we won't see the Kansas City Chiefs and the 49ers. Well, you can see the previews when you go home. Listen, what's more important? You going to heaven or are you going to hell? What's the choice is yours. 
But I want to tell you if you're saved today, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure that you're saved and you've got eternal security? Those are the reasons why you have it. What will you do with today? Will it just be another Sunday that we just came and we just worshiped, we just stood here? Will it be another day that we say, I've not been sure, but I want to make sure. I want to ask Christ to come into my life. I want him to reassure me and encourage me. Because, folks, you will not be unsure if you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You will not be unsure. Do you hear me? You will know with a satisfaction and an understanding of what Christ has promised. But some of us do not know what Christ has promised you. Some of you do not understand you're in his possession. You're in Christ. And you're just floundering around in this world. It's time to stop and live in eternal life today. Be in heaven. Don't be on earth. We're just passing through. We're just sojourners. Our place is in heaven. And we'll be like Jesus. Are you like Jesus today? Is your behavior like Jesus? If it's not, this altar's open. Would you come and say, I'm sure? Or will you come and say, I'm not sure? But I want to receive him. And he'll come in and give you a new nature. And you'll become a new creature in Jesus Christ. How to be sure you're eternally secure. Folks, some of us have unrest in our lives because we're unsure. Make sure you're sure today. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we stand and sing in just a moment, Jesus paid it all, all to Jesus. You see, Lord, we're asking for us to surrender it all. You're telling us that we have eternal security, and there are some sitting here that have doubts. I know it without a shadow of a doubt in my mind. They got saved because it was the thing to do or mom and daddy told them to do it. But have they ever made a personal decision for you? And asked you into life and is, are you real inside of them right now? And if it's not, they need to be sure. And if you don't know if you're going to heaven, would you come? Jesus paid it all. He died for you. He loves you. And he accepts you. I hope today that you leave sure that you have eternal security. Lord, bless you and direct us now as we stand and sing. Jesus paid it all in 134. And we pray this in your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Will you join us by standing and singing 134?